Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back students we have looked at the dislocation characteristics we have also looked at dislocation motion and we also looked at uh, the fundamentals which derive or which define the slip system so for on what particular plane in a given material system would the dislocations move next we are going to look into a very important concept related to dislocations which is critical resolved shear stress which is what defines how much or not defines but this is what will help us determine what will be the stress required for dislocations to move so let's look into it let's assume we have a single crystal so this single crystal is in the shape of a cylinder like this and inside this we are looking at one particular slip plane so the question we are asking is how much stress or load we need to apply say along p so p is the load here and if we know the area then we know what stress is to be applied so sigma you can say is to be applied in this direction for the dislocation to move We know that the dislocations will move only under shear stresses. So the question is, what will be the resolved shear stress along the budger vector? So let's say if we were looking at dislocation independently, which is shown in the bottom here, and this is the budger's vector, then what we are interested is in finding that what will be the total shear stress acting along budger's vector. And on the plane on which this dislocation can move. So that is what we want to identify. And it has to, and uh, here we have given the load in terms of P and we know the area A, or you can have as well defined it in terms of Sigma. So let's say we want to find out the stress. So that way we will know what is the stress required for the dislocation motion, which in turns would mean the initiation of plastic deformation. So here we know that the angle between normal to slip plane, which is this normal to slip plane is given by N. and tensile axis. So this is the tensile axis P and this is the normal. So the angle between them is given by phi. So angle between the slip direction. So let's say this is the slip direction, meaning the budget vector is like this, oriented somewhere over here. So that will define the slip direction. So we want to know what is the angle between slip direction and tensile axis. And this is the tensile axis. This is the direction of the slip or the budget vector, which is where the resolved shear stress must act. And this is given by this angle lambda. Now, if we know these two angles, we know a lot of information. Let's see how. So now we have area of the slip plane 
So if this is the system, then the area of the slip plane is large. So this is the slip plane now in this orientation, this oblique case, which would mean that the area of the slip plane, which is inclined, at angle phi is given by a by cos phi where we all we where we know that the original area this this area is a so this area was a not this one this is a by cos phi the load which is or the stress p by a stress was acting along this direction so now we need to find the stress acting along the Burgess vector which is tau r so that would be given by component of load this would be P is acting in this direction. So cos lambda is equal to P cos lambda. So now we have the load and we know the area and therefore we are in a position to find what is the stress acting here. And therefore that would be given by resolved Shear stress acting along slip direction on the slip plane, on the given slip plane is equal to tau r is equal to p cos lambda by a by cos phi which is equal to p by a this is very similar to or in fact it is along the same lines where we found or where we did the axis transformation here also we are doing the axis transformation and of a particular quantity. And therefore you can see that the form of the equation is similar. Therefore, in the end, what we get is this. Tau r is equal to P by A, we know is sigma cos phi cos lambda. So what this equation is saying that if you want to find the dislocation, uh, stress or the shear stress acting on to this dislocation where the Berger vector is along this direction and it is moving on this plane where you are given that sigma or p by a is the stress acting along this direction then the shear stress on this particular dislocation would be sigma times cos phi times cos lambda that is what we obtain from this equation So does this mean that once we have uh, any amount of shear stress acting on the dislocation, the dislocation would start to move? The answer is no. You need a minimum shear stress along this direction for the dislocation to move, which is what we call as critical result shear stress, which we'll get to in a moment. But before that, let's be very clear about a couple of things over here. And let, let me put it like this. So we have tau r n, which is this one, and p. So we see in the image, in the two dimensional image, it may seem like that tau our p and n are all in the same direction. It need not. Okay, so this is something you have to be very clear about. 
that this tau r, p, and n need not be in the same plane. For example, the Berger vector could have been pointing in this direction. So this whole thing would have been rotated like this over here. And therefore, tau r, p, n would be here. And the, sorry, the p and n would be here. And the tau r and p would be like this. So in the general case, tau r, p, and n would not lie in the same plane. need not lie on same plane. And the corollary for this is that phi plus lambda need not be equal to 90 degree. In fact, that would be a very special case where phi plus lambda is equal to 90 degree. Even lambda, it may in some orientation of this drawing, it may look like lambda is equal to 90 degrees. So let us be very clear about that too, that no, lambda need not be 90 degrees. Of course, in some particular case, it can be 90 degrees. So with this, uh, we have now, resolved or found a relation to find what should what would be the resolved shear stress acting on a slip uh, on a dislocation with a given Berger vector which is oriented with where the slip vector or the Berger vector is along this given direction so we all we know all these vector with respect to or in terms of the angle so the Berger vector is oriented with respect to p at an angle lambda and the plane normal is oriented with respect to p at an angle phi and like you said, this is tau r, but just because the shear stress is being applied, it doesn't mean that the dislocation would start to move. We need some critical value for the dislocation to move. So what is that critical resolved shear stress? So this is the minimum minimum value of tau r so tau this will be called tau c r s s so minimum value of tau r that must be applied for dislocation to move So this is minimum value or a threshold value. The, uh, shear, critical result shear stress is a minimum or critical or a theoretical uh, threshold that tower must reach before the dislocations can start to move. And what it implies is that if tower is less than this critical value, then there is shear stress on the plane, but it is not enough. And also there is force on the dislocation But it but dislocation does not move. So tower must be equal to or greater than this critical value before the dislocation starts to move. Tower, what now, what is tower? It is a variable which is dependent upon applied stress, geometry of the crystal and orientation of the slip plane. So we saw it is dependent on sigma, it is dependent on cos pi and cos lambda. 
On the other hand, tau CRSS, the critical result shear stress, it would be a fundamental property of the material, just like the yield strength. So yield strength is something we describe it with respect to polycrystalline materials. But in single crystalline material and for a given slip plane, we will define it in terms of tau CRSS or tau critical result shear stress. So tau R is a variable. So it keeps changing, not tau CRSS. Tau CRSS is one quantity, while tau R is a variable quantity. It is dependent on applied stress, geometry of the crystal, and orientation of the slip plane. So even inside a given geometry, there may be different slip planes. So it will also depend on that. While tau CRSS is a fundamental property. is a fundamental material property and a constant. And this tau CRSS can be said to be is single crystal equivalent of yield strength. In brief, when we keep increasing the load or that uh, the tower keeps increasing and when it reaches this tower reaches a critical value, which is what we call now as tau CRSS, then dislocations start to move and yielding takes place. So the re overall relation for tau CRSS would still be defined like this tau CRSS is equal to sigma cos phi cos lambda, but then this would be a particular value. And this is uh, one particular uh, value where the dislocation start to move. So it is for the given phi and lambda, whatever the sigma comes out to be, that would be the stress at which the dislocation start to move. And it would, in fact, this sigma would be determined using this value tau CRSS. And for all other values, what we will say is that tau r, whatever value we get from this relation is equal to the resolved shear stress. So tau CRSS, as you have seen, is a critical value where the dislocation start to move. But then if it will uh, probably also remind you of another parameter that we had studied earlier and uh, looked into, which was called P, the Pearl Navarro stress, tau PN. And that was also the stress at which the dislocation start to move. The question is, what is the relation between this CRSS, the tau CRSS and the tau PN? So we want to understand what is the relation between tau CRSS and tau PN. So what do you think? Are they the same thing? Are they something completely different or they have no relation amongst each other? So it so happens that both these quantities reflect the minimum shear stress. Why we are actually discussing it here is for this reason, that both these quantities minimum 
sheer stress to overcome lattice resistance. In Taupian also, we saw that there is uh, there are these per, uh, energy valleys, and uh, we derive from that, or we can derive from that energy valleys by the, uh, by taking the first differential. We can find the shear stresses, and those shear stress. If you took look at the amplitude, if your shear stress overall shear stress is less than the amplitude, then it would mean that you will not be able to come out of the valley. And therefore the minimum shear stress that you need to apply is the equal to the amplitude. And we that is what we called as tau Pn. So that is also the minimum lattice, uh, the minimum shear stress that you need for the dislocation to move against the lattice resistance. And here also we look at the tau Pn is a shear result shear stress along the dislocation, but it will not move unless it is over and above some critical value, which is what we call as tau CRSS. So below this, it is as good as saying that it is inside the valley. And when you apply stress higher than this critical value, then the dislocation start to move. So what is the relation? That is the question. And the answer is that actually both of them are, both of them represent the same phenomena. The same, um, I wouldn't say phenomena, but both of them represent the same quantity. However, there is a slight difference between the two and it is given here. So tau Pn is actually a theoretical quantity. So you see, we obtained that based on theoretical model. And in that theoretical model, we have not taken into, at least until now, we have not taken into account temperature. So tau Pn is a theoretical um, energy, or sorry, theoretical stress that is required for dislocation to move. And also that it is a theoretical value only for zero Kelvin, because we have not considered the temperature part, at least in the equations that we have dealt with. On the other hand, Tau CRSS is an experimental quantity and therefore whatever temperature you are doing the temp test, it represents the resistance at that particular temperature. And therefore it is a temperature dependent quantity. If you do it at very low temperature versus at very high temperature, you would get different values of Tau CRSS. So that is the main difference between the two. However, both of them represent the same thing that is the lattice resistance of the lattice resistance against the movement of the dislocation. So let me summarize what we what I just mentioned. Tau Pn is a theoretical quantity while tau CRSS is an experimental quantity. Tau Pn is given for zero Kelvin, while tau CRSS is obtained for a given uh, whatever temperature you have done. So that was the second difference. So this is the relation and we must keep this in mind because it's not that we are talking about two different things. So with this understanding, now let's move on to understand another aspect about this result shear stress. And we have looked that there is a factor cos phi into cos lambda. Now this factor cos phi by cos lambda, this can be 
termed as m or equal to uh, so cos phi into cos lambda which is also called as smid factor now if you look at the relation again that we had obtained so tau r is equal to sigma times cos phi cos lambda or m and if it happens to be crss then sigma is given by tau crss by m meaning that this um, stress that you need to apply for the dislocation to move on a given plane would be lowest when m is highest and when is m highest when cos phi times times cos lambda is highest so people have done experiments where they have changed the values of phi and lambda so you get here this is uh, done where phi has been changed from 0 to 90 degrees and cos lambda was kept constant so that your cos phi to cos lambda values changes continuously and uh, what you can see is that when the cos phi cos lambda value is the, uh, the angle is somewhere close to 45 degrees that is when you would get the lowest value of the yield strength and if you were to draw the smid factor values then it would actually be the inverse of this so this will be highest over here so this is highest value for m and at the same point you would get lowest value for sigma so the planes which are oriented close to 45 degrees would give you the or there you would need the lowest uh, stress the tensile stress for the dislocation to move and uh, this is in line with what we have already observed that when you apply the tensile stress then along the 45 degree planes you get the highest shear stress so this is uh, you can say corollary of that because the shear stresses are highest over there that is where that is why the planes oriented close to those 45 degree planes would show the lowest value of yield strength and uh, a corollary of this we can look at this is over here is like this so when can we get the highest value uh, of the cos phi cos lambda when the angles are lowest so for maximizing so we will show quantitatively that this is this lowest value of yield strength and highest value of smith factor would actually be obtained for 45 degree so for maximizing smith factor angles phi and lambda must be minimum and it is minimum uh, so far we have assumed that they can be in different planes so phi can be in one plane and lambda can be in another plane but if you want the total to be minimum then these two must become together or it must be in same plane therefore it will be minimum when all it will be absolute minimum only when when tau r p n lie in same plane and when that is the case that would mean that phi plus lambda is equal to 90 degrees and hence maximizing cos phi cos lambda you can now 
apply the simple mathematical rules to maximize the cos phi times cos lambda. is same as maximizing one by two sine two lambda because now they are related by this relation. And it implies that two lambda is equal to 90 degrees or lambda is equal to 45 implies phi is also equal to 45 degrees. So you see we have mathematically obtained that Schmidt factor would be highest when phi is equal to lambda is equal to 45 degrees. And at that time, at that particular configuration, you will have the lowest yield strength values. Thus, lowest stresses are required for yielding of planes close to 45 degrees. Now here we have taken configuration such that some planes were coming at 45 degrees. However, in uh, practice, depending on what orientation of the crystal you take, so not it need not be necessary that some planes are actually oriented close to 45 degrees, which means there is no slip plane at 45 degree orientation. So what it means is that all the planes closer to the 45 degrees would be the ones that would, this, this is what this drawing is showing, will lead to the lowest yield strength or with this, uh, these are the planes where plastic deformation or dislocation motion would begin. If at all there is a possibility that there is a slip plane at 45 degrees, then of course, thus this location motion would take place over there. But if not, then the ones closest to 45 degrees would be the ones where dislocation motion would take place. And as I mentioned earlier, just a few minutes back that this is also a corollary of what we had seen earlier that when you apply normal stresses, the maximum shear stress is at 45 degrees. So this is a artifact of this. So now that we understand this, now let's, uh, okay, I've missed T here. So now uh, we are in a position to look at certain examples. So let's try to solve some problems related to this. Okay, yeah, so one point I missed uh, that I wanted to say, which is the topic here, hard orientation versus soft orientation. So the orientations which are close to the this region would be called the soft orientation, meaning you need less stress for the dislocation to move along those planes while the orientation which would be over here would be called hard orientation. And in fact, at uh, zero degree or 90 degree, those would be called very, very hard because you cannot, no amount of stress, uh, the tensile stress can make dislocations move on a plane, which is just normal to it. Because the simple reason is that there is no component of load, which would be a stress, which can lie on this particular normal to it. So that is, the reason that makes it hard orientation. Okay, so with that, now let's try and solve an example. So the question is determine the tensile stress that is applied along the one bar one zero axis of a silver crystal to cause slip on one bar one bar one zero bar one one system. So basically this is telling you the plane on which the dislocation is and this is telling you the uh, slip vector. It is not the Burgess vector, just the slip direction. So Burgess vector would be probably A by 2, 0, 1, 1, 0 bar 1. And it is silver, so we already know it is the FCC system. And the stress is being applied along 1 bar 1, 0. So just for the sake of com uh, completeness, let me draw the overall configuration, it would look something like this. So this direction is one bar one zero. And there is a plane, which is one bar one 
one and let's say there is a dislocation over here and let's say the Berger vector is like this. So this direction would happen to be zero, one bar one. So that is the overall configuration that have you have been given. This is the normal, which would be one bar one bar one. And we have said that this is the So let's say this is the phi and this is the lambda. So we know that the angle between Berger vector and the normal is the phi and the angle between the normal, sorry, angle between the normal and the Berger vector or the slip direction is lambda and the normal and the loading direction is phi. So this is phi and this is lambda. So next what we need to do is find the phi and lambda and uh, therefore cos phi is the, by taking the uh, cos of these two vectors and this is simple that we have one into one plus minus one into minus one plus zero into minus one. And on the denominator, we will take the square root of this one square plus one square, actually minus one square plus zero square. And the other one is minus one square. Sorry, this was just, I have not uh, written it very neatly here. It should be just one, there is no minus sign. So this is, one square plus minus one square plus minus one square and therefore it comes out to be two by root two into root three equal to two by root six and cos lambda will come out to so now we are taking the cost between one bar one zero and zero bar one one so this is one into zero plus minus one into minus one plus zero into minus one. And this one we already know is one square plus minus one square plus zero. And this one is also the same zero square plus minus one square plus minus one. Actually it is zero bar one, one square. And therefore this is one over root two into root two equal to one by two. So we know that sigma is equal to tau CRSS by Assuming that this is the stress, normal stress that will cause the dislocation to move, we have used CRSS and the CRSS is given to be six. Therefore, this is six by two by root six into one by two, and this comes out to be six root six is equal to 14.7 megapascal. So if 
we have a dislocation with slip vector along this direction and this is to be gliding on one bar one one bar one bar one then you need to apply a normal stress of 14.7 megapascal along one bar one zero for it to move the dislocation that is what this example tells us so you can see this is uh, very helpful in helping us understand which particular dislocation would move and what is the stress required. Next, we will look at an example to understand of the various slip planes in a system, which one would get activated. So here, until now, in this example, we are looking at one specific slip plane. But the fact is that there can be more than, in fact, there is a lot more slip planes, as we'll see. So you are in this example, you are given that a single crystal of copper is deformed in tension. So again, we are applying tension and only that here it is in a little different direction. So this is again FCC and this direction is given as 112 and here you are not given any specific slip plane. You have been asked to calculate Smith factors for all the possible slip systems. And for that, we need to remember what are the possible slip systems in FCC. So 111 plane and 110 type of directions. And you are also, the second part is if you are also given, if the critical result shear stress is 50 megapascal, what is the tensile stress at which the material will start to deform plastically? So first we will look at which one has the highest Schmidt factor. And then for that, we will calculate the tensile stress that would be required to make the dislocations move. So we will begin with um, the planes. So what are the possible slip planes? So you, here we can assume that basically there are slip planes like this. And why I've, been, I've drawn this, it will become clear to you like just in a moment. So what are the slip planes? and the uh, possible slip direction. So so we'll find cos phi, we'll find cos lambda, and then we'll find Smith factor. And eventually we will find sigma. So this is the table. And here we will use first the 111 plane. And very easily you can show that uh, slip directions possible for this are slip directions I've written, not the budget vector, because we'll have to add that factor of A by two, but that is immaterial from the point of view of calculating cos phi and cos lambda. So the possible directions are bar one, one zero, or you can also take the negative bar one, zero one, and zero bar one, one. So I will show it for two systems, and then I will just note down the values for other systems. So over here, we will take the cos phi, which will be between 111 and 112. And uh, we know the relation cos phi equal to H1 K1, H1 H2 plus K1 K2 plus L1 L2 divided by H1 square plus K1 square plus L1 square under root times under root H2 square plus K2 square plus L2 square. The one, the equation that we used in the previous example. So I will not go through that, but I will just write the values and it will be two root two 
by three, this will be constant because this is constant here. And the cos lambda would be different. So you would see that 112 and bar 110, if you take the dot product, then it is zero. What it means is that this slip direction lies in the same, in the plane normal to 112. So the bar 110 is normal, is like this. And which is not a good news in some sense. Zero. And here we'll get root three by six, root three by six. So again, I'm not going through the equation. You would use the same equation that we used in the previous uh, example, and you can find cos phi, and similarly you have, find, you have found cos lambda, and then you take the product to find Smith factor. So this is zero, this is root six by nine, this is root six by nine. I'm not finding the sigma values. I will do it only for the one which comes out to be the lowest. Next plane that we will select is, so there are four one, one, one type planes. And so we'll need to do this four times. And the directions here are 110, 101, and 011. So you can see that these two are dot product is zero. So this is indeed the vector that lies on this plane. And then we will calculate the cos phi, which would again become, which comes out to same value. And the cos lambda comes out to root three by three, root three by two, and root three by six. So the overall Smith factor comes out to root six by 18. And the third plane we will select is one bar one, one, and the three directions are one, one, zero, bar one, zero, one, and 0, 1, 1. And here also the, this is a little different. Okay, so I have made a mistake here. That's, there is no two here actually. So this one is also root two by three. And the values are root three by three, root three by six, root three by two and the Smith factors come out to root six by nine, root six by 18, root six by six. So we have done for three planes. Now the fourth one is a little bit, you can say very different, one, one bar one. And the four directions are bar one, one zero, Now, what happens here is that one, one bar one is at 90 degrees. So the cos phi comes out to be zero. So now from here itself, we can say that the M would be zero, but anyways, we'll go through the motion and find out the values. So these are the lowest mid factor. And certainly we are not interested in this, which is the highest Smith factor that we see over here. And you would see that this value is highest. Similarly, we get another root six by six, which is this. So these are the uh, slip systems where the Smith values highest and which would mean that the yield strength value would be lowest. And if you calculate, what you would see is that 122 megapascal, 122 megapascal. And uh, just 
So what this means is that if this is zero, no matter how much stress you apply, this will not deform. So this will, I will just say ND, meaning not deformed. ND, ND. Similarly, we had obtained zero over here. So this is also non-deformable plane or system. So this one is non-deformable. And just for the sake of completion, it was not the, it is not required here, but just because we are here, I will, for the sake of comparison, I will put the values of how much stress would be required for dislocation to move in this slip system. You would see that it will come out to 184, 184, and this one will be, this mid factor value is very low. One eighty four, three sixty seven. So these two have the lowest amount of tensile stress required for dislocations to move. So for this particular orientation, we have four different planes, and we on the four different planes we have again three different directions, and for that we get these different values. Now. For the, again, uh, what is what would be useful here if I put in the values in terms of orientation, rotation, or the angle between this one 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 plane and the tensile direction. So what you would see is this one would come out to nineteen point five degree. This one will come out to sixty one point eight degrees. This one is also coming out to sixty one point eight degrees, and this is coming out to be ninety point zero degrees. So actually the way I had drawn is a little bit incorrect. So there are two planes which are at 61.8 degrees. So something like this and something like this. On the other hand, we have a plane at 90 degrees. So it is like this. And one is at 19.5 degrees. So this one is So clearly the stress is required for this plane and for this plane. In fact, this one is undeformable. This is the last one where the Schmidt factors come out to be zero, meaning no component of load will lie in here, which is what we know. And therefore there's no amount of stress can make the dislocations move in this plane. Here, this one, you can make it move only that you would need much higher stresses and which is clear over here. And in fact, one of them still would be non-deformable. For these two systems, we see that we do get, these are close to 45 degrees, which is what we expect, which is where the shear stresses would be highest. But then we also have to look at the direction and looking at the direction, we can clearly see that there are two, one direction in this one bar one, one, one plane and one bar one, one plane where the yield stress required for moving the dislocation is lowest. So these are our preferred, or uh, you can say the answer, uh, orientations that we are looking for, where the di dislocations would start to move at the lowest tensile stress. Or in other words, if you were keep pulling the, this, this particular system, if you keep pulling along one, one, two direction, then the first dislocation to move would be on these two systems and in those two particular directions where the dislocations would start to move and then it will cause the plastic deformation to begin in the system. So that gives you a understanding of how to find the dislocations that would start to move. So in within a given slip system, which particular dislocation system starts to move and what would be the stress required given the critical resolved shear stress. So, and we also realized that critical resolved shear stress is something equivalent of a yield strength in a polycrystalline materials. So these are the some important concepts that we got to learn today. And we also solved some problems with that. So with that, we will 
come to end of this lecture. Thank you.